I'm Alex Stark. I'm a senior researcher at New America, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this panel of experts on Yemen um, on behalf of the political reform and international security programs at New America. There have been a number of political and humanitarian developments around Yemen's war in the past month or so, including a UN negotiated truce and kind of a reshuffle of the internationally recognized government of Yemen at a meeting in Riyadh. And I'm thrilled to be speaking with some of the absolute top experts working on Yemen today to really learn from them about what all of this means, um, where they see the direction of the conflict going. Um, each of these panelists has extensive experience and I'd really encourage you to read their full bios online. Um, I'm just going to, for now, give you the kind of the brief highlights to introduce them. Uh, Nedwa al Dausri is a conflict and policy analyst and a specialist in Yemeni tribes with over 18 years of field experience in conflict management and civil society development in Yemen, including at several international organizations like the National Democratic Institute and Center for Civilians in Conflict. Maisa Shuja Adin is a senior researcher at Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. She holds a master's degree in Islamic studies from the American University in Cairo, where the focus of her thesis was the radicalization of Zaidism. Abdul Wasya Mohammed is Oxfam's advocacy, media, and campaigns manager in Yemen. And he has worked with several INGOs in humanitarian and development settings across Yemen. And uh, Adam Barron is a writer and political analyst who was based in Sana'a from 2011 to 2014. And he's also a former New America ISP fellow. Um, so I want to start with, with kind of a basic question for all the panelists. Maybe we can start with Maisa and, and, and then we'll go through. But um, what are kind of the most interesting or, or surprising effects of the recent events uh, that have happened around Yemen, including the, the truce and the replacement of President Hadi with the Presidential Council? How do you kind of see those events shaping the conflict and um, are there any particularly overlooked or maybe underanalyzed aspects of that? Um, is it for me? I will start with me, <laughs> okay. Um, I think nothing is surprising until now. Uh, the Saudis, they are trying I for one year since they, um, they announced their initiative uh, with, uh, to the Houthis, last year in march last year that uh, to start to stop the war i think this is part of their attempts to end their military intervention in yemen um first they replaced hadi president hadi by presidential council which was one of the houthi demands and also because hadi has become a burden for the saudis have become a burden for the saudis so they have to get rid of him and um also, they try to negotiate it with the Iranian. Uh, and it seems this negotiation, it goes far somehow. Uh, but I have to clarify that uh, the Iranian, they can influence the Houthis, definitely, especially in the decisions that re are regarding uh, the peace and war with the Saudis. But still, some internal issues, they can't they can't influence the Iran, uh, the Houthis on it. For example, I think uh, Marib for the Houthis, it could be an internal demand. It's not something also, it's not only a regional demand. It is for them because they want um, to establish their own state. They already, they already start to establish their own state. They change, they change the education curriculum or what all their behaviors inside Sana'a seems that they are going to take this state and they are not going to uh, to concede this this power in these areas for sharing power with anyone else so i think the houthis they are establishing their own state according to their vision which is a religious division it is a theocratic state and uh, they want a financial res resources for this state which is Marib can provide this financial resources. And also, I think they want also to unify what was known as the Northern Yemen before the unity in 1990. So I think Marib is, for them, it is an internal demand. It's not an Iranian one. So the Iranian can influence the Houthis. This is true, but 
to what extent in some internal issues, I don't think they can influence them. And they can't limit their ambitions, especially in the internal, uh, in the internal level. Uh, this is my <laughs> first intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Nadwa, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, so the, the, I agree with Mesa, nothing is surprising. Uh, the one very important thing that happened is Hadi's removal. Um, and I think that's a good thing um, and a little overdue. Hadi was not a good leader um, and his lack of leadership created divisions within the anti houthi forces, which, you know, fed into, um, which kind of played into the hands of the Houthis um, militarily. Um, and um, um, so this could potentially open up the opportunity to kind of unite the anti Houthi forces politically as well as militarily. And that could be, you know, one step towards peace. Um, if things work well in between the eight members, <laughs> um, I mean, these are eight members, every one of them have a different agenda and their backers also have different agendas. The Emiratis and the Saudis have different agendas. So if the agendas did not align, this could be, this could make Yemen's conflict 10 times or eight times more complicated. Uh, Adam, what do you think were kind of the most important uh, or interesting takeaways from the, the last month or so in Yemen? I mean, I think all of the points that have already made are quite, are quite um, are quite valid. One thing, I mean, just based on my own personal experience, I happened to be in Aden basically up until maybe a week before, uh, actually, yeah, up until three or four days before the, the GCC consultation started. And what was interesting then is there's been a real shift in terms of the tone and momentum of how, um, how different political factions have been speaking to each other. So on the ground in Aden for most of March, despite everything, it was quite a competitive tone. You know, different factions were looking at, you know, if you look at areas, particularly Shaba was emerging as a major flashpoint uh, with different key political groupings, really non-violently, but the political competition was, was quite strong. The tensions were, were quite palpable, both in Shaba and on the West Coast. What you've seen that's dramatically changed now is a shift towards, at least for the moment, a more collaborative um, and cooperative um, politics between different groups in the anti-Houthi front. Um, you know, to some extent, I've joked calling the, the Riyadh consultations a handshaking festival, but at the same time, there's nothing wrong with the handshaking festival in terms of it does suit a particular set of set of means. And if it does shift sort of the, the tone of everything, if it does shift the momentum, perhaps that can have significant follow-on effects uh, with the rest of the conflict. Of course, what the Houthis are thinking is the elephant in the room um, for the Houthis and many other and their allies in Sana. Um, a lot of what's happened in Riyadh, they've been remained quite, at least publicly and to some extent privately dismissive of what's happening um, in Riyadh. So in a way, the ball really is in there, is, is to some extent in their courts. Um, and I think you've seen as this truce has extended, Tensions starting to emerge, different factions within uh, the Houthis or Ansar Allah uh, figures sort of raising issues with what they view as unfulfilled elements of, of the ceasefire. Um, we can all debate whether or not that's valid or not um, and, and the fine points of that. But the larger point is the fact that it shows that <laughs> there is um, a new stage potentially is about, is about to emerge. Um, and, and we'll see how that goes. Of course, the speed of shuttle diplomacy from key international factions, I think, has never been has never been as high. Um, but I mean, it comes down to the fact of of what people ultimately see as their red lines or their must haves on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdul Wasya, um, you're uh, working in Sanaa with Oxfam. Can you update us on the, the humanitarian situation on the ground? Do you see anything that's changed as a result of of the truce, um, and and could you also comment on maybe the likely effects of of rising global food prices that we've seen recently uh, due to the war in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll be happy to do that, Alex. And uh, yeah, before I do that, maybe just to one one uh, short comment on on the first question. Um, I think uh, the, the truce is is very interesting because uh, this is the first time in six years. You know, both parties have. A sort of committed to to a truce that long, and we know of the history 
uh, in the previous years, uh, 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 parties have failed to commit to uh, uh, the, the uh, numerous uh, uh, attempts from the international community to bring them into the table. Um, and also the, the replacement of Hadis is, is an interesting, um, it, uh, uh, it, it represents a change, especially in the, the, the South, but it's yet you know, for civilians to see the real change in, on the ground, uh, especially that the same cabinet, the same structure is, is still running the show uh, for the past seven years. Um, but in general, the truth represents an ample opportunity for, for all parties to uh, make or, or bring about a, a tangible a change uh, for, for civilians, uh, which we are yet uh, to see. Um, on the humanitarian situation, it is uh, or it remains uh, dire with uh, families still struggling to survive um, uh, amid shrinking economic opportunities. Uh, the, the people are still suffering or experiencing the lack of salaries, uh, price inflations, and deteriorating services and, and conditions. Uh, food is available in the markets in large quantities, however. Uh, not everyone can uh, uh, afford them. Actually, the majority of the population can afford that uh, uh, the, the food. Uh, on top of that, also the humanitarian response is uh, underfunded. And if it remains so, uh, it will risk the suspension or reduction of uh, life-saving aid. Um, the, uh, what we have been witnessing uh, in the past one month and, and almost nine, uh, 10 days now since the uh, start of the truce, um, is that there, there was a remarkable reduction in violence and in, in, in security. Uh, these are the, the, the key outcomes of this truce. Also, access has improved, you know, both for civilian movements as well as for uh, humanitarian access. Um, uh, uh, humanitarian actors were able to reach hard to reach or, or no-go areas. Uh, roads in some key areas, including Hudaydah, um, have been opened for the first time in, in, in four years. And uh, the overall security situation has improved with uh, much enhanced access uh, uh, for movement across government rates. Also public utility services, uh, especially in the Southern part of the country has enhanced and this has to do with the presence of the government in, in Adan, also the, the, uh, 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 the, the starts of the parliament sessions in, in, in Adan as well. Um, and uh, this will have you know, further effect if it continues uh, because uh, people will have a sort of you know, rebuild the trust with the, system, with the system and also they will, uh, 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 institutions will, will also be effective uh, fearing uh, accountability at least from the presence of the government. And, and uh, that sort of consensus among the different factions in the government is quite promising because it, it uh, uh, it, it brings back uh, stability, uh, especially in the, uh, uh, especially with the reduced political tension in the, in the south. Um, uh, coming to the Ukraine crisis, it had a, a major impact on the prices of, of key commodities in, in Yemen. Uh, as as most of, uh, of you all uh, know, uh, that Yemen uh, uh, imports uh, over ninety percent of its foods, uh, medicine, and Ukraine is an important source. Uh, for the imports, uh, uh, especially of key commodities like wheat and uh, uh, oil. Now, a uh, million uh, haven't seen their salaries you know, for, for years and, and some see it delayed for up to six months. And even when salaries are available, uh, they are not even enough because the average value of the uh, salary is still the same compared to the uh, pre-conflict uh, uh, level. And uh, um, this, you know, leaves people uh, 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 struggling, especially with the deterioration of the currency. And uh, also, uh, you know, this leaves families uh, hostage to, to uh, debts, uh, forcing them to sell their personal assets, belongings, and also, you know, they further lose hope uh, for uh, progression. Over. Thank you. Um... For folks in the audience, please feel free to drop your questions uh, and we'll, we'll try to integrate as many of those as possible into the conversation. So we have a question um, from Mohammed El Shanawi of Voice of America. What could make or break a peaceful settlement in the war in Yemen? And, and I'll add to that maybe what, um, 
what are, after the title of this event, what do you see as maybe the prospects for peace and how that has changed over the past um, month and, and few days? Um, Maisa, would you like to start? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, definitely for the Saudis, they have many motives, motivation to stop the war because this war, um, it, uh, it is a disaster for them, for the repetition, for the economy, for many things. Um, for, the, for the Houthis, I think they, they are under economic pressure these days. And there is a kind of popular resentment in Sana'a and other areas because of the oil crisis, because of uh, the crisis of the oil and the gas. And um, there are many accusations that the main reason it is their corruption and the black market. It's not about the blockade and the war, as they say. So there is an increase in resentment that you can see it uh, in the social media. You can you hear it always from your family, from our families, from our friends in Sana'a. So they are under pressure. And they need, uh, they need to, um, and they need to apply their vision. I mean, they have a vision uh, in ruling Yemen. I, I don't agree with it, but they have this vision. And this, they want to apply it in a peace way. Uh, not in a peace way, to apply it, I, I mean, in a state, in, in a state that it is internationally recognized. It's not necessary to be independent in the state. It could be a very loose federal state, um, a very decentralized state. And they have a kind of, of their autonomy in their areas. But um, I mean, they, they want to um, establish their own state. I think they have their network that they want to benefit from uh, ending this war. But definitely, they have a big military wing, and it's a very radical one. And also, it is very connected to Iran. So also, the Iranian intervention here, it is very critical to, uh, to, to lay some pressure on the Houthis uh, to stop the war. Thank you. Um, Nadwa, what do you think about uh, prospects for peace? Um, I mean, the Houthis, like Maisa said, the Houthis have a, a very radical uh, political ideology, and their vision is to control all of Yemen and liberate Mecca and Jerusalem. And that's no joke. That is that's at the core of their vision. Um, and if they have setbacks, they might kind of, you know, slow down just to recharge and, and then resume. Um, they're not going to stop military operations because it goes against the, their vision. It goes against their goal. Um, and so I don't see uh, any, and they're, they're also part of you know, Iran's expansionist agenda in the region. I can't talk about Iran, uh, but I, I know that the Houthis um, are not going to stop voluntarily. They're not going to compromise. They're not going to accept the power share unless they are the, the they are in control. Um, so in my opinion, the only way to bring peace is to weaken the Houthis militarily. Uh, now we've seen the Houthis soften a little bit after the operations in, uh, in Shabwa pushed them up to the, you know, the giant forces pushed them out of Shabwa and parts of Marib. Um, and and it's, it's the Houthis way. Whenever they feel threatened militarily, they soften so that the other side slows down and then they, they, they take that opportunity to reposition their forces and they've been repositioning their forces into Marib. Um, they've, they haven't respected this truce. Um, and so, if, you know, they need to be weakened militarily in order to open up, you know, an opportunity for peace. Um, the problem was that I don't know if that is what the Saudis and the other Yemeni forces want. Um, in, yeah, I know that the other Yemeni you know, forces want to weaken the Houthis militarily, but they're entirely or almost entirely um, subject to the positions and the uh, decision of the Saudis and the Emiratis. And I don't know where the Saudis and the Emiratis stand. It seems to me that the Saudis, I agree with Mesa, they do want to end this conflict. They do want to end their military intervention, but I think they're confused how to do that without, you know, um, military pressure. 
and I don't think that they're interested in a serious military pressure that will uh, weaken the Houthis and you know bring them to a point where they feel that uh, a peace settlement is their best alternative. Adam, you mentioned that the Houthis are kind of, and, and where they're, they're looking is, is kind of the elephant in the room here. And, and Nadwa mentioned that there have been some uh, violations of, of the ceasefire. Could you talk a bit about kind of how you see um, the Houthis fitting into all of this and, and what are the, the prospects for them to, to potentially come to a peace agreement? I mean, there's a few wider elements and I guess it's almost like how they fit in with with everything, it's not necessarily even about their own internal thinking. One, I mean, this is a war that has its manifestations all over Yemen. But I think the more it looks at it, if you look at the bulk of the fighting, it's been concentrated in a few areas. And unfortunately for the people that live there, it has be so much of the fighting has become concentrated just in a single small strip of Matab when you look at it. And it's, it's like sometimes I increasingly wonder whether the bulk of the fighting could be concentrated in just a handful of districts in Marab indefinitely in the sense that this has become, when you look at the Houthi uh, forces and powers in Sana'a's assessment of, of what they want, what they need out of the war, et cetera, both need in terms of how they view the economic situation, need in terms of how they view resources, and need is in terms of having something to give to their constituents. I, I do wonder to what extent the battle for Marab could go on quite indefinitely. And if you look, I mean, Surwa has been an active frontline since since before decisive storm even started it's it's astounding how long this could go on two i think you have had at least prior to the riyadh consultations you had a situation where despite the fact that all of all of the parties that are against the houthis are saying we are going to fight the houthis they were focusing more on competition between themselves in areas where the houthis are no longer are no longer present so for example it's very easy if you are say um one of the anti-Houthi factions to say, you know, we want to go, we're going to take land, but it's much, it's much harder to take land from the Houthis than it is to go against um, one of the other anti-Houthi factions in their area, that sort of battle for influence. And you've seen that manifest itself in places like Taiz, in Shabwa, in, even in Aden to some extent, in Hadramaut. Um, so the real question is, has the foundation of this presidential council and the theoretical inflection point of the Riyadh consultations, has that changed that? Are the anti-Houthi factions now, whether due to certain agreements that have been made, the encouragement of their, of their funders, um, are they now more willing to work together to fight the Houthis? Because that could be that could be a game changer. If you have coordin if you had theoretically coordination between all of the key different fronts, you know, uh Tardik's guys in the national resistance pushing on the West Coast, the SDC guys pushing on their respective fronts, uh the people in Mada pushing their tribal resistance, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That could be a game changer. Um, but I think it remains to be seen whether that's going to happen. Um, and I think essentially the ultimate fate of this presidential council also remains, remains open. This can be a council of peace. You know, this could be the group that goes and negotiates directly with the Houthis, um, leads negotiations for some sort of peace settlement. It could also be, you know, a council of war in terms of something that provides some sort of manifestation, uh, you know, the unification of the fronts um, that could help to greater mobilize um, the the efforts against the Houthis. Or, or the third option is you continue sort of the the broader pattern of the past few years, uh, just in a new face. You know, this kind of slow motion muddling on fits and starts a war of attrition, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the unfortunate part of a war of attrition is it'll continue to be hurt, hurt. I mean, it'll hurt the entire country, but it will hurt people in, in a small handful of places the most. Let's face it, it will hurt people in Mada, Thais, et cetera. Um, but Sada, Sada always gets hit hard. So we'll see. We'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, Abdul Wasi, as part of the, the truce agreement, there were also uh, pieces about allowing some commercial flights into Sana'a and, and fuel shipments into Hodeida port and a conversation around opening the roads to Taiz. Can you talk about um, how, how implementation of those pieces of the truce has, has happened? Is it happening? And also kind of how will that potentially affect the humanitarian situation? Uh, yeah. Uh well, uh, you know, this is what makes the uh, truce itself, 
you know, over the past uh, couple of weeks now, we have seen uh, parties not agreeing on certain aspects or, or bits and details, including on the um, uh, reopening of the Sana'a airport. Um, uh, apparently, there have been uh, some uh, differences on uh, uh, some details related to passports and all that. And I think these are gaps that uh, the international community should invest on, you know, when, when uh, uh, considering uh, pushing for an extension of, of this uh, truce. Um, uh, now, when it comes to the Hodeida port, uh, we have seen uh, a, a good flow of, of fuel to the northern part of Yemen through the Hodeida port. Um, uh, fuel has been one major issue, you know, for, for the northern areas because the Houthis have been importing fuel through the Hodeida port. And with all those things, those inspection uh, uh, processes uh, constraining the smooth flow of of uh, uh, fuel imports. Um, this has resulted in, uh, uh, you know, shocks to, to, to uh, prices. It, it, it contributed to increasing prices. It affected even uh, life-saving sectors like health. Uh, now, for example, in some other governorates, we have been witnessing, uh, before the truce, we have been witnessing uh, a, a severe fuel shortage that led to uh, uh, severe impacts uh, on, on prices where people, they, 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 they already struggled, you know, to uh, 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 find uh, uh, or to, to afford uh, prices. Um, and, and I think, you know, when, when, when uh, talking about prospects for peace, I think this is an ample opportunity, you know, since we have seen this unprecedented uh, agreement between all parties that, um, the international community should maybe invest in, in uh, bridging those gaps and solidifying you know, an agreement, maybe by pushing first for uh, a, um, an extension of the truce and uh, maybe engage different uh, regional actors, those who maybe the Houthis uh, perceive as neutral, um, including the Romanis, the Kuwaitis. Uh, we have seen how the Romanis have done uh, uh, or were effective over the past uh, uh, month um, um, with their uh, missions, you know, to Sana'a and, and, and uh, actually managing to uh, get a lot of things done, and and I think uh, we should we should build on 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 uh, on these uh, developments because I think all these factors play a major role in uh, shaping uh, 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 the prospects for a, a lasting peace in, in Yemen. Mesa, you have written about the. Um... The, how the Presidential Council reflects the political and military situation on the ground, but also that it could end up kind of reinforcing the divisions that have become deeper throughout the war. Um, we've talked about a little bit about how the Presidential Council could become a council of war or a council of peace. Um, what do you foresee for the Presidential Council um, and, and its potential contributions towards a longer term peace or not? Mm. Yes, uh, in the statement and the first uh, speech of the president of the presidential council, they talk about the Houthis as Ansar Allah and uh, they are willing to negotiate with them. So um, they said we are going to fight in defense. So there is no longer talking about any kind of uh, Retrieving Sana'a or returning to retaining the legitimate government to Sana'a or all of these things, or even forcing the what is called the three references, the three references which is, which is uh, uh, the UN resolution um, in the first of the war, it is 2016, uh, 2216, and uh, the National Dialogue uh, Conference outcomes, and the um, third uh, one, it is the GCC initiative. So it is no longer, no one talk about this uh, references. And definitely the Houthis, especially the UN resolution, they refuse this uh, political references and they want to establish a new situation according to what the war results, resulted. So what happened, it is that this uh, presidential council, it is a result of this war. So the Houthis can join this presidential council because this criteria, it is not something belong to Yemen before the war. It doesn't belong to the Yemeni constitution. It is something that 
represent what happened during this war, what had, what had happened during this war, what militia that had been emerged during this war. And this militias now they are representing in this presidential council and the Houthis, they can represent themselves as well as any other uh, forces or militia or whatever we can call them now. <laughs> So I think this presidential council is a turning point uh, about the truth. It's about the political will of both parties. I have to say that the coalition, their appetite, their military appetite stopped or it's becoming very low after ending, after the international intervention to end the, uh, the coalition advance in the Western coast in Tehama. After the um, agreement of Stockholm, in December 19th, uh, in December 2017. After that, that coalition appetite to expand in Yemen, military, militarily wise, there, there is no appetite. So I think all what they want is to protect their areas, to make, to keep the division in Yemen and to keep controlling the areas that non houthi controlled area, which is, which they have now, and they keep it. This is all their ambitions now. So it's about the Houthis if they are um, if they are going to join in this uh, to be serious now and uh, to stop dreaming in Marib uh, because as I said Marib is important for them for their own state for their what they what they dream in this state and they need financial resources uh, so and also if happened if it happened the truth collapsed. And now the Marib, it is most potent, uh, most probably Marib will be the next bottle after this truce if it, if it collapsed. So it depends to the results of the bottle in Marib. If it's in favor of the Houthis, which will weaken a lot the position of the, uh, the coalition and the allies, the Yemeni allies with the coalition, or it will be in the favor of the coalition and they protect Marib and Marib didn't fall in the hands of the Houthis. So this will keep the situation as it is now. Um, Nadwa, you have written about the role of local mediators and, and tribal leaders in preventing violence and, and negotiating um, the release of prisoners, for example. Um, what roles do you see local leaders playing in mediation efforts and how might those sort of local effort, efforts be linked up to the national level and the UN process? Yeah, I mean, the tribes have have actually been instrumental in maintaining order and stability and security in Yemen um, since the beginning of the war and well before the war. Um, they they provide justice, they resolve conflicts. Um, they've been instrumental in uh, exchange of thousands of prisoners. Um, and they have um, also helped protect civilians, evacuating civilians from you know um, conflict areas, um, negotiating passage for civilians. Um, and the interesting part about tribes is that during conflicts, tribe actually, Tribes have revenge killings and conflicts amongst them, which they manage to contain. But when there is a conflict, they also freeze their internal conflicts, freeze their revenge killing and, and tribal conflicts. And one of the really interesting things that I've seen um, over the past few years is that a lot of the tribal, in, in tribal areas, um, some conflicts that have been around for decades have been resolved. Um, like really uh, complicated land disputes and revenge killings. Um, so, and that's tribes way of neutralizing their internal conflicts in order to avoid um, the potential for the war or external conflicts to come and, and destabilize them. Um, the, the tribes cannot, the tribes, the influence of the tribes is really at the local level. Um, in their areas, within the tribal areas, between tribes. Uh, so they function at that level. Um, the tribes cannot influence when it comes to political conflicts and national level conflicts. The tribes don't have the leverage or influence to change those dynamics or to pressure the conflict parties to even de-escalate. Um, again, you know, the 
the maximum thing they can do at that front is really prisoner exchange and allowing passage for civilians and things like that. Um, but if the conflict parties, and that's a big if, if they did decide to end the conflict, if they decide to commit, seriously commit to, this, to ceasefire, including the Houthis, if they decide to commit to ceasefire um, and de-escalation, the tribes can be very, um, um, the, the tribes will be instrumental in kind of implementing the ceasefire mechanisms. Um, and at the local level. So what they can do, they can open roads, they can negotiate open roads. And there's a lot of negotiations about open roads. It's not just going to be, okay, we're going to open the road. There's a lot of logistics that go in, into that and the tribes can help with that. They can negotiate the release of prisoners. They can negotiate, uh, for example, uh, clearing landmines, um, protecting certain public facilities and making them again, accessible to civilians and you know others as well. Um, they can also help implement the ceasefire if there are, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the parties agree on certain, you know, process to implement the ceasefire. And, you know, the one thing is the international community does not need to engage the tribes because the conflict parties actually will use the tribes. It's, it's the to-go mechanism for every Yemeni politician, every Yemeni, you know, um, power, uh, you know, um, player, you know, since the beginning of time, they will use the tribes automatically. Because again, a lot of these people in power also come from tribes, you know, half of the presidential council come from tribal background. Um, most of the people in the military, uh, commanders and others come from tribes. So, it is embedded in Yemen's rich peace building and, and de-escalation mechanisms. And so right now they can help mitigate the conflict at the local level, make it a little you know, easier on civilians. Uh, but if there is a, a genuine ceasefire, genuine, genuine commitment to ceasefire um, and de-escalation and end the conflict, uh, the tribes will, will be the main uh, element of it in terms of um, implementation. Thanks. I'm going to um, pull out a few questions from the audience and, and kind of throw them out and um, maybe you all can decide which ones you'd like to answer. And just a reminder for folks in the audience, please um, leave us your questions. So uh, we have a question from Hannah Porter. How do Southern secessionists feel about Zubaydi's membership in the presidential council? Do they see it as a win for the Southern cause or a betrayal of it? Um, another audience member asks uh, whether you could elaborate about future scenarios in, in Marib, um, especially if the truce collapses. Um, I'll take the Southern one, I guess. Sure. Um, I think with regards to by and large, I think it's when you one of the things that people don't appreciate enough about the STC is the extent that they have been playing a long game. Um, I think a lot of times because I mean, going back, particularly pre pre war um, and then going back even further pre 2011, the South has been marginalized in many Sana, not just the South, all of the all of the areas outside of the Sana Ali, but particularly the South has been largely marginalized in Sana centric um, narratives regarding regarding Yemen. So it is, I would say, when you look at how the STC is playing, is playing things strategically in terms of incorporating and the networks that ended up, for that matter, the networks also that ended up making up the STC have played in terms of incorporating themselves within power structures in order to create their own networks. Um, I would say that in a lot of ways, having Idrus in this position is, is a significant victory for them. This is a legitimization of the STC by, in some cases, literally people who are now members of the of the council who were extremely critical of the STC and said, you know, you know, rather, you know, you can say things that now look quite radical by comparison, considering they're all shaking hands and hanging out in Riyadh together. Um, I would say that the, for the vast majority, there is has always been this tension before the STC even existed between sort of the formal southern movement leaders and leadership and and the frustration on the streets and there's always going to be that tension between um you know the aspirations of of immediate uh, succession and the immediate restoration of, of the state and all of these things and 
and which is is politically possible perhaps um but moving forward i think this does represent um a potential opportunity for a shift in how in how all of this is done you know for the vast majority yes idrus was governor of aden yes lemlas was governor of shabwa yes uh you know after the riyadh agreement uh, lemlas was named was named um a governor of governor of, of aden that being said i think by and large the way it's kind of been in terms of incorporation has not worked as of yet so now we get to see whether it was a matter of <laughs> Of the structure or not and i think there is a there is a sense at least from people i speak to uh that this shift in the structure um does present a potential new opportunity um that being said i don't think anyone is is overly optimistic um and i think there does you know let's let's face it in in many regards the past five six seven years have have only served to increase um separatist secessionist uh pro restoration of the state whatever you want to call it uh, sentiments about southerners among southerners over uh abdul Basia, do you um on the question of marib uh has i, I know there have been some violations of, of the truce there but has has the truce allowed for uh an alleviation of, of the humanitarian situation in there and how are you um, and, and humanitarian sort of thinking about uh, the future of Marib? Yeah, well, obviously the truce was um, a good outcome uh, in terms of the reduced violence. Um, usually when fighting, and, and as Adam mentioned, uh, Sirwa and other fronts in Marib have seen uh, massive fighting and um, uh, you know the, the displacement was on daily basis and, and that has meant increased uh, needs and, and more people, you know, pushed to areas where, where uh, they cannot easily access services. And, and some families as well, you know, had to walk for days uh, to get to safer places. And um, yes, there have been uh, some uh, minor clashes here and there, but uh, the, the, the reducing violence and, and um, uh, across the different front lines in Marib um, has been significant. And um, by the end of this truce, you know, we're, we're I, I mean, from my own point of view is that, you know, we're, we may uh, uh, be faced with two possible scenarios, maybe an extension of the truce. And um, uh, another scenario would be a, a total breakout of fighting uh, and, and Marib would see the, the, the you know, the, uh, the, the most share of it, of, of the fighting, uh, especially across the, the different front lines in the South with, you know, already reports uh, uh, indicating that there has been reinforcements to, to the um, uh, coast or, or to the lines of uh, the front lines in, in Marib. Um, and, and that's why, you know, we, uh, I mean, we, we, the, the, the narrative, or the good narrative is always to support peaceful processes and, and to, uh, because we have seen how seven years of conflict of military operations haven't resulted in in a um, a good outcome. It's it's always um, um, adding up to the burdens and to the multi-layer crisis people have facing, and the suffering of of civilians, and um, and and this is all happening while we are facing a, a an unprecedented uh, shortfall of funding, uh, and that means uh, we're not able to help everyone and and the. Uh, the, the scale of the crisis in Marib is uh, way bigger than uh, uh, the humanitarian community can can do uh, anything, you know, to uh, to uh, 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 alleviate the suffering of the people there. Oh. I think this is a good question for for Nadwa, but maybe others will like to chime in as well. Um, this is from Yasmin Faruqi from Mercy Corps. How strong would you characterize um, the presidential leadership council's current command and control over their respective factions on the ground um and do you expect that the this could help op, um, overcome opposition at lower levels um wow okay that's a really good question so um there are three uh members four members of the presidential council who command different forces 
You have Tarab Saleh in command of the forces in the West Coast, um, which includes mainly the National uh, Resistance, but also some of the, the Tehama Brigades. Um, you have um, uh, Al Mahrami, Abu Zar Al Mahrami, who, is, uh, who commands the Giant Forces, which is a, a, a probably one of the strongest military forces on the ground, uh, backed by the Emiratis. Um, you have uh, Bahsani, uh, Faraj al Bahsani, who commands the uh, second military region, the elite forces, Hadrami elite forces, about 20,000 uh, soldiers. Um, the ST is Aydin uh, Zubaydi also, STC uh, commands um, most of the forces in Aden and, and surrounding areas. Um, and so these are four different sets of forces that are under four different, you know, command uh, uh, centers. The president of the, the, the council does not really control any forces. Um, and so that's the other part. And Adam talked about that a little bit, you know, I mean, the, the anti houthi forces had a history of you know, fighting among themselves. Um, and it wouldn't be a surprise if that manifests in the coming years. Um, um, I mean, if they unite, they will make a formidable force and they can weaken the Houthis militarily, but then how are we gonna move from that to bringing all these forces under you know, unified command of control? It will be a challenge. And I think, you know, in my opinion, this will be the reality of humans future. It will be multiple forces and there are multiple command structures. And I don't think it will be possible to unite them any, any time in the near future. Uh, I mean, that's giving the, you know, very optimistic scenario of, you know, weakening the Houthis and then kind of, you know, prevailing for these forces. Um, but if the Houthis are not weakened, then, you know, I think we will see, um, you know, we will see this, this, situation where you know you have all these forces and then they clash with the houthis uh kind of low uh low intensity conflict um and you know i i think that that's likely to continue to happen um provided that the houthis don't take matter if the houthis take matter then that's a whole different scenario but uh, you know to respond to the question i don't think we will see uh, military or security forces in Yemen under a united command and control structure, or even two united command and control structures, um, anytime soon. Mesa, uh, do you have thoughts about the connections between those members of the Presidential Leadership Council and, and the forces on the ground? Yeah, um, first of all, all of, the, all of the Presidential Council, it is in the host of because Aydarus is a beauty forces controlling Aden and controlling Mashiq Palace, where they live, all of them. So this is a big achievement. It is a big credit for him and make him the strongest man inside the presidential council because he's the one who can decide if they can gather in Aden or not. They can stay in Aden or not. He's the one who said that. So I don't know if they can balance this situation after a while because the, uh, the head of this presidential council, he doesn't have forces. He's the only one who doesn't have any forces actually, which is a very unique situation. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very weird one actually. And this is, uh, and actually I would say they will not fight each other since there is coordination between the Saudis and the UAE because it is a result of the coordination between the UAE and the, the Saudi Arabia. Uh, if there is a kind, and definitely there is a history of competition between them inside Yemen. So I can say this can last for long. Um, this kind of collective ruling, I have to say, it can work for temporary period, but for long one, it's very difficult. Uh, and that the executive, yeah, I mean the top authority in the country to be to be ruled by different people, by different forces. But this is the the situation of Yemen that now the state doesn't have uh, the biggest military power as it is in everywhere in the world. It should be, and it should be before. Or it was the state, uh, the situation of Yemen before the war. 
that the state, okay, there is an armed society, but the state has the biggest military power in the state. Uh, now the situation is different. Um, we have Tarif Saleh, it is in the Western coast. We have Uthman Mujalli. Um, he doesn't have that big power. He's, his importance coming from being an enemy for the Houthis and he's a tribal chief from Sada. Um, definitely Bohsini, he represents Hadramaut. This is very important for him. And it's very interesting that two of the military, two members in the military council, they are also governors. For example, Sultan Arada, is, he is the governor of Marib, and uh, Bohsini, he is the governor of Hadramaut. And still, until now, they are at keeping the two positions, which is, I mean, it raised many questions about what is the future of this governance and it should be a new governor in this place, especially Bohsini. I mean, okay, Sultan Arada, I would say it is an exceptional situation because he's facing the Houthis. Okay, I will say that, but what about al Bohsini in Hadramaut? So there are many questions. I have to say also there, are, there was a legal committee should be formed to set the regulation of the presidential council and it's it never gathered. And because even the head of this committee, he apologized and said he will not take this position. Um, definitely, I have to clarify that the economic situation threatened everyone inside Yemen. Treating the Houthis, treating even the STC, I mean, the popularity of the STC decreased a lot because of the sit economic situation. So now, which is the biggest test that is facing the, uh, the presidential council, it is the economic situation. Now the summer is coming, the electricity in Aden, what about the situation of the electricity in Aden? This is, this is the real test, this is the real challenge. Otherwise, the other things is not important for the people. What concerns the people, it is the, li the living conditions, it is the economic situation. If their problems will not be addressed, so there will be, their anger will be against everyone, even the STC. So it is the biggest challenge for everyone in Yemen because the economic situation. Thank you. So for those of us who are um, kind of following this from, from the perspective of US policy, I, I wanted to ask each of you if you were able to brief the Biden administration right, right now and what the United States should be doing, um, what would you tell them? And what, what should the role of the US, of the US Special Envoy, um, the international community even, what should their role be in uh, hopefully increasing the likelihood of a sustainable peace and helping to alleviate or stabilize the humanitarian situation? Um, Adam, do you wanna start? I don't particularly want to start, but I guess I have no choice. <laughs> um, she called me out. Um, if I was advising, I would say, I mean, I would say one of the biggest things is to know is to know the limits. And I think the limits of, and I say this with, with all due respect to all of the actors involved, but the limits of, of different countries were dramatically uh, underlined by the conference uh, that was held by the GCC, or the consultations that were held by the GCC in, in Riyadh. This showed that certain countries, certain actors, namely the Saudi Arabia particularly, the GCC as an institution, and the UAE have a far greater capacity than, than other actors in, that, are, that are putting it in, in Yemen, right? Um, if you compare what was happening, the buzz, et cetera, with say the GCC consultations versus the consultations that happened just before uh, they were held by Oseski, it was, it was quite notable, right? Um, but that's because certain countries have the leverage they have the power they they have yemen in their backyard so to speak um not of course not to say that the us uk and other key powers don't have um and key global powers don't have significant leverage in yemen but the flavor of it is different i think when it comes to different powers so it's in that kind of i would say embracing complementarity um and keeping lines of communication open um i mean i remember a few years ago there were questions of people, you know, the idea of speaking with the STC was was kind of something that was people raised questions about. Now the STC is literally 
um, legitimizes the mainstream political political movement. Um, so I think, and finally, I would say there needs to be a focus on what is actually happening in the ground rather than what is happening in various exile loc locuses of of exile political activity. Um, in some regards, you know, it feels like it's a completely different world in terms of what's happening on the ground in Yemen. And this is not just in whether it's areas that are under control of the de facto authorities based in Sana'a, uh, whether we're speaking of Aden, whether we're speaking of whatever, there's a whole new political roadmap that's emerged. To some extent, yes, this political council, the, the presidential council rather, does reflect that to a greater extent than what was there before. But that doesn't change the fact that there is a remarkable disconnect between policy on Yemen, you know, whatever, and what's actually happening on Yemen. Um, and the only really way to combat that is spending more time on the ground, which I understand is difficult due to the security situation, but, but not impossible. And you, because you have seen progressive improvements in that, uh, particularly with visits earlier this year from the Europeans and the Americans, or at least the Europeans to, uh, to Sana'a and Aden and other parts of the country, and the Americans to, uh, uh, to visit Bassani and uh, Sheikh Awad um, in Shabu and Hadramat. Uh, um, and I think, I mean, but then it all comes into the biggest, the biggest larger conceit of, regardless of what we think about it, um, the Yemen that existed before this conflict no longer exists. And we need to sort of move on and deal with that. I, more than as much as anyone else in the world, would love to go in a time machine. If there was a magic fix that brought Yemen back the way it used to be, it would be pretty great. I had a great time in Sana'a before all of this happened, you know, loved it, fantastic, but it's, it's never going to happen. Um, so we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that you can put things back in Pandora's box. Pandora's box has been open. The spirits have been floating around uh, uh, freely for now, six, seven, eight, possibly more years now. Uh, so the only thing moving forward is something that will be a solution that is, impo that is reflecting um, the inside and in, as interpreted and put into framework by outside parties, for lack of a better way to put it, rather than something that is imposed from the outside. And I think if there's one thing of the past, if we want to say 10, possibly more years of Yemeni history show, and regional history, it's not a Yemen thing. You know, solutions imposed from the outside um, tend to have a pretty limited shelf life. Um, look at the Stockholm Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's my two to seven cents. Um, Mesa, what, what should the Biden administration be doing? <laughs> yeah, the problem in the U.S., um, there is no, actually, there is no consistency in Yemen. I mean, in Trump, he will leave the file of Yemen to the Saudis, and Biden, no, the Saudis, they are the wrong people, they are the bad guys, <laughs> and we have to be against them. It's not about that. It's not about... It's, about, it's always a reaction to what the relationship between the US and the Saudi Arabia, mainly. It's not about Yemen. They are always handling the Yemeni fight from this perspective. I can understand they have many interests with the Saudis and nothing about Yemen. But even if you are dealing with Yemen, if you don't have interest with Yemen and you have interest with the Saudis, I think you should, if, you're, if Saudi Arabia is your ally or, or you are not in good terms with them, you should have um, a kind of consensus, consistency with Yemen. Um, for example, to secure at least the cost, to secure at least the region, because it's a long borders between the Saudis and the Yemenis, even between the Yemenis and the Omanis. So it's important to protect this entity to make it at least relatively stable. It's not treating their neighbors. So uh, I think they have, first of all, to realize that Yemen is Yemen. It's not only south, or, uh, south of Saudi Arabia. So Yemen has its own problems. And it's not about Saudi Arabia and Iran only. It's about many complicated issues. And it can be solved totally. It's not can, it can be completely solved, but it can be at least reduced uh, the bad consequences or the negative consequences of the many conflicts inside Yemen and decrease the degree of this conflict. Um, this is the issue. I mean, they, they can, they have to realize that they have limitation in, in their intervention in Yemen, especially with the Houthis. 
and um, and they can do some pressure on the Saudis, maybe on the. And I think the Houthis they can do some pressure on the Omanis. If they can do pressure on the Iranians, the Omanis they are allies to the Houthis. They are not neutral. And they provide for the Houthis many logistics, many service. The Houthis cannot live without them. So the Omanis, you can reach to the Houthis through the Omanis. If you can't reach to them through the Iranians, because it's very difficult for you. So at least the Omanis, they are a good, a good area that you can do your pressure with them because you have good relationship with the Omanis and they can't, and, and they need them. They need the U.S. and they need the Western to, to have good relationship with the West. So I think you, you have to balance your situation. If you want a, a relatively stable place in Yemen, so you have to do pressure in, with the Saudis and Houthis and recognize there is no good guy in Yemen. It's everything is bad. And all what you can do is to reduce the negative consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Abdul Wasya, what should the international community and the United States be doing from your perspective? Yeah, I think the, the US should uh, invest maybe more in the great work that is being carried out by its envoy, Lender King. And uh, I think one key step is uh, to secure an extension to the truce and maybe continue support for the UN, working with, with the, uh, its allies in the region, especially those regional actors, including Oman, as, as Mesa uh, mentioned. And um, um, I get that we always you know, mention Iran, uh, but if, if, if uh, um, the US also can do is to eliminate you know, that um, line of, of supports if, if, if it's evident and um, it can be effective in um, ending the conflict. Um, I think also the US could, um, and also the international community could push on uh, back on the harm, harmful uh, potential decisions that would have huge humanitarian and, and economic impacts um, on the Yemeni people, including the blanket designations. Um, and, and that uh, would have, you know, huge humanitarian and economic impacts uh, in, in Yemen. And also where it has leverage, uh, the U.S. Uh, could support to, to ensure uh, there is an accountability mechanism in Yemen, which we don't have since the, um, the GE was uh, voted uh, uh, to, to expire back in October 2021. Um, and also what is also important is that the U.S. could use its leverage with the IRG to uh, ensure uh, women are engaged and civil society are engaged also in peace processes. Now we see that the, um, uh, the presidential council has no women, zero representation of women. Uh, the um, uh, committee for the reconciliation, reconciliation and consultations has only two women out of uh, 50 members, which is uh, quite uh, shameful and uh, uh, it, it's a failure, you know, to uphold the commitments to empower women. Uh, and um, uh, uh, it is important also that the U.S. Uh, uh, ensures uh, uh, funds are being provided for the humanitarian response. It could use its leverage uh, on the U.S. And, and, and on the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia to uh, provide funds to the humanitarian uh, response as well. Um, and, and maybe more investment on peace than on arms deeds. Uh, that's all I have to say, thanks. Ned, well, I'll give you uh, the last word. What, what should the US and the Biden administration be doing? Yeah, thank you. Um, I So I would say, um, watch how you use your leverage. Uh, the US has leverage on the Saudis, has leverage on the gov Yemeni government. It does not have leverage on the Houthis. And when you apply pressure, on one side, um, most likely automatically uh, help the other side. And we've seen what happened after the Stockholm Agreement when the US pressured the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Yemen government to stop the um, you know, operation uh, to liberate Hodeidah from the Houthis and how the Houthis then repositioned their forces and made massive military gains and how that further complicated the conflict in Yemen and played into the hands of the Houthis militarily. So 
that's one thing um, I agree with Adam and, and with everything that my, my uh, the other panelists said. Um, we have to be realistic. Uh, stitching Yemen back together is not going to happen. Um, and if a peace settlement looks great on paper, you know, a un unity government or a political settlement where the Houthis and every other party will come together, uh, it does not mean that it can translate. And we've seen that in 2011 and 12, how the GCC agreement seemed to be great on paper, but then it actually, it actually um, planted the seeds for the current war. Um, so be realistic, uh, use le your leverage to help Yemen um, one piece at a time. Uh, right now, I think, you know, the, the Yemen conflict is, is complex. Uh, it's probably gonna continue for a while. So focus, having said that, there are areas in Yemen that are stable. There are a lot of things that can be done to help mitigate the impact of the conflict and kind of build blocks for future peace. So focus on things that you can do, which is supporting local economy, supporting local governance, um, you know, uh, training, supporting local forces, not in terms of fighting, but also but supporting local forces, um, training them on laws, international humanitarian law, you know, this way you can promote accountability. Um, and, and again, don't pressure or don't sign, don't use your political pressure to, uh, uh, to force a premature political settlement. Um, um, also, I think one important thing that the U.S. can do is help with the software tanker. This tanker, if explodes or if spills uh, into the, the sea, it would cause, you know, the worst, the worst environmental disasters we've, we've seen in the region. Um, and right now, the U.N. needs only $144 million to fix it. And if it spells, the cost for cleaning up will only will be $20 billion. So, and the UN is struggling to secure the money. So contribute to that, but also talk to the Saudis and the Emiratis to contribute money to that. Kind of use the, your political pressure and your leverage on the Saudis and the Emiratis to force them to uh, contribute to that fund. Um, so final word, Yemen is complex, embrace the complexity. Thank you. I want to thank all, all four of these panelists so much for taking time out of your mornings and evenings to um, speak with us. And, and thanks to New America's events team for helping us uh, to organize everything. Uh, and, and thanks for the audience for joining this conversation. So until next time. Bye.